what I want to do is I want to give you some insights and learning. Some of it, we, we have to all be on the same page. So I may have to, if you've seen some of my talks, you may see a kind of a little bit of a, a repeat as we're all coming onto the same page. But then I am going to be um, delving into new ideas and so forth. Now today we will be talking more from a learning perspective. So uh, about things from, uh, as if you were a learner. On later this week, I will be giving a, a longer talk for three and a half hours, and that's more of the perspective from the teachers. So some of the material is the same, whether you're a learner or a teacher, but there's also much, much more. So uh, I'll be very happy to be sharing there too. So I do want to just uh, start out just by giving you a little sense of how important learning is and learning how to learn. In the, in, the, in the past, the World Economic Forum has often had these lists of most important skills. And in 2015, they had a list of the most important skills. Learning is not on it. And in 2020, most important skills, guess what? Nothing about learning. But 2025, the top 10 skills include right towards the very top, active learning and learning strategies. So part of the challenge has been in the last decades, people have sort of known traditionally how you learn to some extent. They really didn't know how the brain worked. So interestingly, one of the leaders from the World Economic Forum happened to visit University of California, San Diego happened to learn about the popularity of our course, Learning How to Learn, and begin to realize, hey, there's lots of insights about learning that people are finding incredibly helpful. I mean, about um, 5 million students have taken the Learning How to Learn course over the last, um, what, decade or so, a little less than a decade. And we get something like 7,000 people a week signing up for new information about learning by taking Learning How to Learn. So anyway, the reason that this active learning and learning strategies is now suddenly at the top of the list is because the World Economic Forum realizes that we know much more about how you can learn effectively. So, uh, so it's worth it to teach people about how to learn effectively. So for me, I, I should back up and give you just a little sense of my own background, um, which you may or may not know. Um, learning was not something I cared much about when I was a kid. So I, I liked to learn what I felt like learning. And when I didn't feel like learning, I went out and I just, we lived in part of the time in rural Texas. So I would just go out and ride horses. I like doing that. And in fact, my father was in the Air Force. So we moved a lot. And here you see, uh, by the time I was about 10 years or 15 years old, I lived in 10 different places. So the thing about moving a lot is that mathematics is very sequential. So if, you, if you're good at math, it's easy to catch up if somebody's a little bit further ahead of you. If you're not good at math or you don't like math, like me when I was a little kid, it can be very hard to catch up if you move and they're far ahead of you. So when I was seven years old, we lived in rural Texas, Lubbock, and my father was suddenly um, given an assignment to go to MIT and, and get a master's degree there. So we moved to Boston. Boston was very far ahead in the multiplication tables and learning math. I was seven years old. I got there, I saw what everybody else was doing, and I just thought, I can't catch up with these kids. I'm no good at math. So I flunked my way through elementary, middle, and high school math and science which is kind of ironic because I am speaking with you here today 
as a distinguished professor of engineering. And I'm the real deal. I mean, I publish in top journals. I, uh, I'm a fellow of top engineering societies. So one day, one of my students found out about my sordid, terrible past as a math flunky, and he said, how did you change? And I thought about it. I mean, I was a little girl. I just loved animals and knitting and weaving, and I knew I could never grow up and do anything technical. But I wanted, well, so what do they call a person who speaks two languages? Bilingual. What, what is a person who speaks one language? American, right? <laughs> <laughs> or Estadounidenses. So I was a typical American in that I spoke only one language. And I wanted to be able to look at the world through several perspectives. Now, everyone in this room speaks more than one language. So uh, I wanted to be like you. And for you, you're like, ah, it's no magic. You know, you just do it. It's not a big deal. But for me, it seemed magical. So I couldn't afford to go to college. I wasn't hanging around people who were bilingual. And I thought, what can I do? Um, I, I found out I couldn't, there was one way to learn a new language and actually get paid to do it. And that was to join the army. So that's me. I'm looking incredibly nervous about to throw a hand grenade. If you knew how clumsy I was, you would know why I look so nervous. But I did learn another language. More or less at random, I picked Russian. And if I had been smart, I would have learned Spanish, obviously, because our our son-in-law is from Chile, and so our little granddaughter is growing up bilingual, and, uh, and we're very excited about this. So, so I, I, the Defense Language Institute, which is where I studied, is one of the top language study univ or institutions in the world. And I, I learned how to learn a language. What I didn't realize at the time was that this also gave me a lot of insight into how do you learn in math and science. But in any case, I just loved adventures. So I ended up working out, at the, out on, on the Russian trawlers in the Bering Sea. I have very good Russian drinking stories, if you like. Yeah. Uh, so, so we can go out together in the evenings. And, uh, and you can ask me about the KGB and the squirt gun. So, but in any case, I, I also ended up at the South Pole Station in Antarctica. And that is where I met my husband. So I, I always say I had to go to the end of the earth to meet that wonderful man who is sitting in the corner of the room and who is uh, my pillar uh, who I, I'm here because of the, my wonderful, wonderful husband who has been such a great support and full of great ideas over the many decades. We've been married almost 40 years now, so I'm very lucky. But one day, you know, when one of my students found out, as I mentioned, about my, uh, you know, my previous sordid past, he, um, I thought I, I wrote him a little email and I said, well, you know, this is how I learned how to learn uh, in, in working in, um, in engineering and in math. And then I thought, well, you know, I love, I love writing books. So why don't I write a little book about this? This will be an easy one. And my husband was like, yes, this, is, this will be a very good book to write. And he was right. Do you know, so this book, you as an author are not authorized to pick the name of your book. So I, I wrote this book and uh, you know, Penguin Random House said, yes, we're going to publish it. They picked the name of the book and they picked the name A Mind for Numbers. Can you imagine 
a more boring name for a book. I mean, I, if you do a, um, if you set up a Google alert on, on the phrase of mind for numbers, you know what comes up most often? Obituaries. She had a real mind for numbers, right? But actually this book with this information has become a worldwide bestseller selling over a million copies around the world. So people are fascinated by these ideas, which they find really deeply useful. So what are these ideas? I think what's most important is if you look at learning grounded in neuroscience, not in psychology speak, but in actually, there's great information from psychology, but if you also use insights from neuroscience, it can help you understand learning in perhaps what is the best way possible. We know the brain is really complicated, so it can be a little hard to understand what it's, um, what's going on. So let's simplify how the brain works and look at one simple fundamental building block, and that is the neuron. So, it's so funny, I look around and you can see people. You're, you're all just kind of like, oh, the neuron. This is where she's gonna get into the really boring scientific stuff. So let's spice it up a little bit. Let's use a metaphor for the neuron, which is a space alien. And the space alien is, so this, here you can see this space alien has three legs on it. Those are analogous on the right, you can see two dendrites on a real neuron. Now I show three legs, but in reality, there can be dozens, even hundreds of legs on, an, on a, uh, a neuron. And then there's these little spikes that are, are, are coming out. Those are called dendritic spines. Those are like those little toes. You know, there's lots of little green dot toes on, those, on the space alien. So, on the right, those are the dendritic spines. Those are critical for learning. And then lastly, we've got uh, an arm that reaches upwards. That's the axon. And what neurons like to do is they like to essentially reach out and play footsie with an adjoining neuron. They tickle the toe of an adjoining neuron. And what that really is, is sending signals. That's what neurons are doing. They're sending elect mostly electrical signals that jump that little gap called a synapse and go on to the next neuron. And when you are learning something, when you're learning anything, you are making connections between neurons in long-term memory. So, so what does that mean? We have been told, sadly, by educators and psychologists over the last uh, 40, 50 years, you don't need to remember things because you can always look them up. Would I speak Spanish if I just used Google Translate to look it up? You have to, to, to really be an expert on things, you have to have that neural structure within your own brain or you just don't have it. So, so this is why, for example, I had, uh, what, education does, it's always doing this pendulum thing. It's like, first it's like, oh, the only way you can remember or to learn something is to memorize it. And that went on for, what, thousands of years? Memorizations, that's the heart of learning. Then it went the other way. It was like, oh, remembering things is not important. It's conceptual understanding that is what is important. But this is why I had a student come up to me. I'd just given a very difficult test in statistics. He comes up and it's all red line. I, I handed that back to them. And he's like, how could I flunk this test? I understood it when you said it in class. And so the challenge has become that we are so overboard into the idea of conceptual understanding as being the golden key of learning, that we forget if you don't remember what you understood. It doesn't matter if you understood it. 
So those links of long-term memory that you are forming as you're learning things are critically, critically important. Now, how do you form and strengthen those links? Part of it is you, when you practice, you're building and enhancing those connections. So if, you know, as you're practicing more and more, you are in essence strengthening those links and those, those become much easier to draw to mind whenever you might need those ideas. So, so this brings me, remember at the beginning when I said that um, uh, we were gonna use a metaphor of the space alien? Using metaphors is a powerful tool for learning. When I wrote that book, A Mind for Numbers, I, have you ever heard of a website called ratemyprofessors.com? Do they have that here? Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a website where you can go and look at evaluations. It's often in the English speaking world and you can see what other people have thought, thought about your professor. So there's a way you can go and look and see the top two to 300 professor teachers who have been evaluated as top professors in the English speaking world in dozens of different topics, you know, engineering, English, of psychology, economics, whatever you are looking for, you can find it. I wrote to, uh, thousands of these professors, uh, top professors, and I asked them, what do you use to learn? And I sent them a copy of my manuscript and they were just, uh, they gave me all sorts of great insights to improve that book of mine for numbers. But surprisingly, the top, top professors would often say to me, there's this one thing I do when I'm teaching to make things easier for my students. And I encourage them to do as well. And it really helps them, but I don't tell my fellow professors that I do this. And that one little thing was they used metaphors and analogies to help convey ideas and to, to encourage their students to more easily grasp these key ideas. And they didn't tell fellow professors about that because the fellow professors would say things like, ah, that's why you're so popular as a teacher. You, you use metaphors, you make it easy for the students. And it's like, well, that's our job as teachers. So, uh, so, but that's also what you can do when you're trying to grasp a difficult topic is to uh, ask yourself, what is something like can I create a metaphor for it? So, um, so this, you know, of course, let's say I'm using water to convey the idea of you know, current flow for either water or for electricity. So it's a metaphor. You know that at a quantum level, that metaphor breaks down. The thing is, every metaphor breaks down sooner or later. When it does, you just throw it away and you get a new metaphor. So I want to move now to a different thing. So we're going to have a little test here. So I'm going to ask you, what is the way you use most often when you're learning something new? What do you think is the most, you know, what is most helpful for you as you are learning something? I'm gonna give you four techniques and then I will ask you to vote for one technique that you think is the best in helping uh, you to learn and maybe in helping your students to learn. The first technique is rereading, which I did a lot of when I was relearning in math and science. Or is it highlighting or underlining? Retrieval practice. So that means like using a flashcard um, or something to, to see if you can retrieve it, the idea from your own mind, or is it creating a concept map? So that means drawing out all the key concepts that you're learning about and then connecting those ideas together. So, so 
we're going to have a little vote now. I'll ask you to raise your hand at the one technique that you think is best, either for you or for your students. So how many people think rereading is best? Okay, I did lots of rereading. Okay, how about highlighting or underlining? Okay, it helps you focus. How about retrieval practice? Okay, fair number, and concept mapping. Okay, okay. So, are you, uh, do you wanna know what the answer is? I'm gonna keep you in suspense. <laughs> so, the answer, and this has been shown in hundreds and hundreds of studies, is retrieval practice. That is by far the most helpful. So you might say, well, no, we've been told for decades that concept mapping is the best. Here's the problem. So uh, a researcher, a, group, a little group of researchers came up with the idea of using concept mapping, writing out the key concepts, connecting them together. And they said, you know, they had devised this technique. So they went out to everybody and said, this is the best technique for learning never checked it. They just told everybody that and everybody believed them. And finally, in about 2012, uh, a psychologist named Jeff Karpicki with his um, undergraduate student, Janelle Blunt, published a study in the journal Science, one of the top uh, research journals in the world, and, and revealed that when they did a careful analysis and study, you learn best key concepts. You remember them longer if you use retrieval practice. It works far better than concept mapping and all, every other technique. So when this paper was published, the authors were allowed of the concept mapping papers were allowed to rebut this study. And so they published their rebuttal and they said, you know, Carpicky just didn't do it right. He was supposed to use four hours of, re of uh, um, practice and training in concept mapping. And that's what he should have been teaching all the students to do. And then Carpicky was allowed to rebut the rebuttal. And in Carpicky's rebuttal, he showed the quotation from the, the uh, concept mapping experts themselves saying, it's so easy. You can teach people how to do concept mapping in five minutes. That's all you need to do. So um, since that time, uh, as I mentioned, there have been lots of studies. I'll show you a few of them, but I want to give you a physical feel for what's happening with retrieval practice. So, when you're first learning something, like right here, right now, you are getting a little bit of faint links in your, your long-term memory, just very faint ones about the ideas that I'm teaching about. But each time you retrieve those ideas from your own mind, you are strengthening those key ideas. If you just write it down on a piece of paper with the key concepts, it's just like taking notes. Taking notes is not what's of great value. Reviewing your notes and pulling the ideas of those notes to your mind, that's what's of value for students. And so um, I do want to also um, give you another sense. So let's go back, look at, watch, Watch that. So, oops, hang on, let's get back here. So notice, initial learning, you got some weak links like from me or from the book you're reading or from whatever you're studying. This is important. When constructivists sometimes approach teaching and they'll say, figure it all out yourself. That's what's gonna be golden. But actually, teachers matter because they help you know which way to go to lay those initial links. Because you can, you can lay them in all sorts of different directions or you can not lay them at all. The 
whose weak links seem like they're unimportant, but they're really vitally important. So in any case, there, as I mentioned, there have been hundreds and hundreds of studies that have shown that retrieval practice is by far the best way for learning. You might say, well, no, it's only for like memorizing anatomical terms or memorizing vocabulary in other languages. It's not true at all. Actually, when you, let's say you, you are walking along the campus here and you try to retrieve some key ideas about a marketing concept that you are trying to, to learn about as a student. When you are retrieving those ideas, you're connecting them, you're deepening, you're strengthening those sets of links. So using retrieval practice is critical. If you only use retrieval practice for silly little things, like, you know, I say silly, but they're actually important. You know, like vocabulary words or, or like some of the fundamental concepts that you might teach in whatever you're, you know, or, or learn in whatever discipline. It's, it, it's, it's the question to ask yourself. You can ask yourself, um, what are the fundamental occurrences of the French Revolution? What are the fundamental things that happened during the Russian Revolution? Then you can ask yourself a higher level question. Compare and contrast the Russian and the French revolutions and see what, you know, and so you can ask yourself retrieval questions that are simplistic or much deeper that you can contemplate as you're doing your studies or going for a walk or having a cup of, of this great Guatemalan coffee, you know, whatever you're doing. Now, what happens if you, uh, so for example, let's say you have a very busy life, as most of us do, and you learned something, but you don't have time to go back and retrieve it. What happens? Well, your little synaptic janitor will just sweep away those synaptic connections or those dendritic spines because you're not using them. So this is why retrieval practice, especially when you're first learning something, can be so valuable. We can also see, this is, you are all budding neuroscientists now. So this is a dendrite, the leg of that neuron in real life. And you can see all these little things hanging off it. Those are real live dendritic spines. This is a dendrite with its dendritic spines before learning and before sleep. So I'm going to show you the same living neuron after learning and after sleep. Can you imagine what does this look like? Is it going to have a fatter leg? Am I trying to trick you? I'm very good at that. So let's look at it after learning and after sleep. Look at wherever those little blue triangles are. The, the blue triangle on your on the left at the bottom that shows if you compare that dendritic spine with the image up above there was no dendritic spine there earlier it emerged during sleep and the upper dendri the upper blue triangle it shows like a thicker head on the dendritic spine this happened during the, after the learning and sleep process. So you can see, neuroscientists have actually shown that in the brain, there's like a wave during sleep that circles around the brain. I guess like a, you could sort of think of it like a toilet flushing, right? But it circles around the brain. And what that is doing is that's actually physically reinforcing some links and sweeping away other links. So this is why sleep is an important part of your learning process. Uh, you don't want to neglect or say, oh, oh, I'm just going to ignore sleep. 
but you're going to see even more about why sleep is so important. So, uh, so hand in hand with retrieval practice or with a, uh, retrieval practice is something called spaced repetition. And this is, as you can see here, you can see there's links. So let's say you have five hours in a week. You might, there, this is just one way of doing this, but you might do one hour per day over five days. And what's happening is you do one hour of study that lays some links, but during when you go to sleep at night, it reinforces those links. Next day, study, then reinforce. Now, our tendency as students can be to do everything on one day, cram it. But when you cram, what that does is it makes weaker links that are easier to sweep away. So sometimes really good students will cram at the last minute. And if they're smart, they can still do well. This is because they're, um, they're using links in the hippocampus, which are only temporary. So what can happen is they can do well on an exam, but the next semester, the, that foundation has not been laid. They'll forget the material and they don't do as well. This is why sometimes really, really smart students can do well, go through, uh, graduate first in their class in high school, go to MIT, and suddenly they're floundering because they, they've gotten used to studying at the last minute. But when they're with some really competitive other students, that technique doesn't work very well, but they don't have good study habits yet. And so then they can struggle. So, uh, so this is actually a, a problem sometimes for really, really smart students. But I love metaphors, as you can tell. So a good metaphor for all of these ideas is the idea that you're laying a, a brick wall when you're learning. So you lay a layer of bricks, mortar, bricks. But before you go too high, you, you take your time. You let that mortar dry. If you don't do that, if you don't take your time with your learning, you can have a pretty bad foundation for learning. So it can make things more difficult for you. So, uh, so another analogy that I think is a good one is just weightlifting. We can, look at a, we can look at this guy and we know that he did not sit there the night before some world championship thinking, you know, I'm going to cram tonight. In, in fact, it took him a lot of time to be able to uh, create that muscular structure. And it's similar for neural structure. It's just that we can't see inside. So we think we can do things at the last minute and that's, um, can, that way lies danger. But while I have you thinking about uh, weightlifting and uh, exercise and athletics, I do want to add something that I think is important for you uh, in your life of learning. And that is, we know that exercise is one of the most profoundly important uh, and useful ways that we can improve our ability to remember and to, uh, to learn effectively. We never knew why that was. Like, they knew that swimmers during swimming season would get better grades, even though they had less time to study. Why was that? Now we finally understand why that is. So if you look right here, this is a, a, a dendrite, that leg of the neuron. This is before a substance called brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF, is sort of sprinkled on these neurons. And BDNF is released in the brain when you exercise. It's kind of like a fertilizer. So let's see what happens to this dendrite when we sprinkle this athletic fertilizer of BDNF on it. Look at this. It's like these dendritic spines just explode out and go, okay, 
I'm ready. Just learn me something because I'm hanging around here waiting to get connected into things. So this is part of why uh, exercise can be so valuable as far as helping you to be able to learn more efficiently. So if you uh, struggle sometimes in your learning, ask yourself, let, because sometimes people will be like, I can't focus very well. And part of that can arise because people will, you know, they don't have enough exercise built into their lives. So, you know, a little bit, if you're already a good athlete, no worries. But if you, if you don't have much exercise built in, you know, try to enhance a little bit with, uh, with some additional exercise and you'll find it's helpful. Will it turn you into a super genius? No, because otherwise all these Olympic athletes would be super geniuses and they're not, but it will help enhance whatever you are naturally capable of doing. So I do want to give you just a little bit of uh, extra insight into why sleep is so important. So it, um, it turns out that when you are thinking during the day, these metabolites, kind of toxins, build up in the brain, especially in the areas of your brain that are working really hard with what you're studying. And what happens during sleep, watch this, I love this part. So look at those little cells. They will shrink. Your brain cells shrink when you go to sleep. And this allows the cerebral fluids that are always flowing past to flow more rapidly and easily. And they wash those toxins away. So it's a, this is yet another reason why sleep is so valuable. Um, Einstein, interestingly, he slept around nine hours a night. He was a, he was a very good sleeper. He really liked it. So I think we can, uh, but everyone is wired a little differently. There are some people who have what is called the short sleep gene. So those individuals, they can get by on four hours of sleep a night quite nicely. I wish I was a short sleep gene person. But uh, you know, check yourself. If you're weary during the day, clearly you need to get, be getting a little more sleep when you can, given the fact that sometimes life throws things at us and it can be a little difficult. Also watch nutrition. If you exercise and have a good uh, nutrition, it can each, that enhances both of the effects. So it's like it's better than each one individually. So good by good nutrition, uh, I mean things like you know, ensure, and I think this is easier to do in Guatemala, where there's, you know, well, there is fast food everywhere in the world, but you also have these wonderful, very nutritious vegetables and fresh things here that huh, it's, you have a wonderful country. So. You can get plenty of garlic, uh, onions. Those are of a good family that give you a lot of um, nutritive um, substances that your brain needs. Uh, cabbage family sorts of things like Brussels sprouts uh, and so forth. Add some nuts to your diet. Fruits, of course. Um, dark chocolate of a kind like around here can be very helpful as well. But uh, with all of this, remember that, that desserts are not a food group. So try to avoid them, um, even though I know it can be a little difficult. Here. So I know most of you in this room are a little um, more mature. So I want to give you a little bit of insight into what's going on in the brain when you are trying to learn something. Indeed, as you become older, Theta waves are like, so they go from a frequency of around four to eight hertz. So it's like four times to eight times a second. They're these slow ripples that go through your brain. These help synchronize your thoughts. So even if the neurons are not directly connected together, it's like a bunch of quarks that are floating on the same wave. So you can connect your thoughts and you, 
You walk into the kitchen to grab something. And have you ever been like, why did I walk into the kitchen? What, what did I want here? It's because those theta waves are not actually holding the information together in your working memory as they should be. So is there anything that we can do to help reconnect and build those theta waves? And it turns out that there is. In fact, action style video games are one of the best ways to help you to build your, um, your, build your cognition back to the way it was when you were younger. And I'm going to show you a nature um, study that, uh, that, that found exactly these kinds of results. So the study is cited in the lower right. This was the cover of an article in Nature, which is probably the most prominent paper uh, uh, journal in the world. And I'm going to show you three different brains. One brain is, or it's like a group of average brains of people in their 20s. And other is people in their 60s. The last one is people in their 60s who have had cognitive training with video games. Wherever you see this kind of red stuff, the warm colors, that means there's more activity there. So, so like the, the red brain is, that's kind of where you want to be. It's a really active, good cognition, lots of good stuff. So guess, what I want you to do is guess which one is the students in their 20s, which one is, stu is people in their 60s, and which is people in their 60s who have had cognitive training with video games. Do you have it in mind? Which one's which? Okay, there we go. Amazing, isn't it? Uh, and it turns out that some of these video games are actually um, under FDA approval process to help people with um, enhancing their cognition as they grow older. So when people sometimes will say, oh, video games, oh, that's bad, kids should never do them. No, they should never be overdone. That's exactly right. But for us older types, it's not necessarily a bad thing. So I want to switch to a, a sort of a different kind of thing here, and then we're going to have a little activity. So let's, um, I want to give you a sense of the different modes of thinking that people will, um, they naturally use in their everyday lives. So this has been, these different modes have been found by neuroscience. One, I'll call the focus mode. It's kind of like what you're doing here, you're focusing. The other, I'll call the diffuse mode. And it's like when you're mind wandering. So you're standing in a shower, maybe going for a walk, your, your thoughts are wandering. So to better understand these two different modes, what will we use? I think I heard it. Oh, video games, that's kind of what, oh yes, it is. That's probably the best answer I've heard, even though what I was actually looking for was the word metaphor. But the metaphor we're going to use is the basis of video games. So excellent, excellent. You were like two steps ahead of me. So, so um, years ago, they had pinball machines. And those are the basis of many modern video games. What you do is you just pull back on a plunger, this ball goes bouncing around on the, the rubber bumpers, and that's how you get points. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this video game or this, this pinball machine and put it right on the human brain. You ready for it? Okay, there we go. So this is the pinball machine on the brain. And this is a metaphor for focus mode of thinking. So 
So you can tell it's focused because look how close together those little rubber bumpers are. When you think a thought in focus mode, like let's say I said, I want you to multiply 20, 23 times 74. You might haul out a piece of paper. A few of you maybe could do it in your head. And those thoughts would move right along pathways you've already laid in your brain that allow you to solve that problem. You've learned multiplication pathways. But what if you are learning something completely new? So let's say you are, um, uh, you, you already know how to multiply, but you have not yet learned division. So your instructor teaches you about division. You come home that night, you're working away, your parents are maybe gone, you're trying to solve this problem, and you realize you cannot figure out what's going on. You start reading, you're trying to find something, you're getting more and more frustrated, and what's really happening is you're trying to lay a new pattern, as you can see. There's a new pattern of division you're trying to lay as you're solving those problems, but your mind can keep slithering back to multiplication because it's so con you're, you're so used to it. You've done it a lot. So what can happen is you can get more and more frustrated, and then you end up just closing the book, walking away. And as you walk away and start talking with friends, maybe have dinner with family or whatever, your mind gets off of that problem and guess what? It opens that very different, much more broad ranging, diffuse mode of thinking. So you can't think in the careful focus where you can when you're in the focus mode, but you can at least get to that new place you want to be so that when you return to focusing, it suddenly makes sense. Learning often involves going back and forth between focused and diffuse mode. You cannot be in both modes at the same time on the same topic unless you're taking certain forms of of drugs, and I'm not <laughs> suggesting that here. So, uh, so you want to, when you're stuck on something, allow yourself to have the time to step back a little bit. And that can really be helpful for you um, as you are trying to make sense of things. Go to sleep for the evening. Um, take a little walk. Go work on another topic. Maybe something a little easier. This will all help you as you are taking your, your break from that focus mode. Now, um, sometimes people will have attentional challenges. So you may have an attention uh, syndrome. And if you think about focused and diffuse modes kind of as tables, what can happen is kind of think of it like, like this. You're thinking, and if you have attentional issues, it's like you have extra holes in that table and your thoughts can fall through more easily even when you don't want them to and you're in that diffuse mode. But it, as it turns out, those with attentional challenges can often be more creative. So it is, it can be a real benefit. Interestingly, uh, meditation itself is, uh, is has different aspects of either focused or diffuse meditation. So this is, I was teaching some monks in uh, Kathmandu at the Turgar Monastery. And uh, their leader, Yonge Minya Rinpoche, is one of the leader, leaders in the world, the most studied of all monks. And what they're finding is that focused, meditation that occurs during mantras, you know, when you're doing a mantra, that's focus mode and it enhances your ability to focus. However, open monitoring types of meditation can also, they can enhance your ability with diffuse mode. So different types of meditation can enhance different ways of thinking. But what I'd like you to do now, is I'd like you to take like 
five or six minutes, and I would like you to just talk with one another. I'd like you to introduce yourselves at the table. You may know your, uh, each other and maybe not. And I'd like you to describe what was focused and what was diffuse mode. What were the differences? And if you have some examples from your own life of focused versus diffuse modes, have at it for five or six minutes and discuss these things. Okay. So I have, so start, you might start formulating. I have more stuff. I have so much more stuff. I could go for the rest of the day, but I don't want to do that because Carmen would get mad at me. Uh, uh, and, but so I'm going to, I'm going to continue on. Um, and, but this is more of a relaxed time. So if you have some questions about anything I've spoken about in the past, or about what I will be speaking about, just raise your hand, wave it, motion attracts attention. And, uh, yes? Hi, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, I was just wondering whether sun has anything to do with your cognitive process. I personally work so much better at night, but, uh, and I've heard that a lot of people have the issue, but I don't know if there's any study to that. Oh, yes. So about 40% of people, it's like their underlying genetics lean them towards being more morning people. About 30% of people are more evening, they call, you know, night owls as opposed to morning larks, and the rest are more balanced in between. Interestingly, um, there's a little bit of evidence that some of it may relate to Neanderthal genes coming from Northern Europe. You'd like, even, you know, you have a little sliver that comes from it because the Neanderthals who were there, they lived during a time frame where they uh, was in the far north. And so light wasn't an issue for part of the year because they didn't have light uh, for a good part of the year. So, uh, so there's interesting relationships there, but for sure, some people just do better at night. I cannot understand those people because I'm <laughs> totally a morning, but it was so fun because my colleague and co-author in working on the book, um, Learn Like a Pro, he is from Norway. And so I would work away and just when I would stop, you know, like six or seven in the evening. In Norway, that's like way into the middle of the night. That's when Olaf was getting started. So he would work all night on the book, you know, and then I'd get up the next morning, I'd have his stuff, and then I'd work away. So it worked out really well. But um, at first, I was thinking about your question, and there is, the sun actually does affect our learning because it sets our circadian rhythms. So a good thing for you to do, especially if you have trouble sleeping at night, try to go outside in the morning when there's slanted light coming in. And that will, that, what that'll do is set a little trigger in your mind so that 12 hours later, you will start to feel more tired. You don't want to sit with glass in between you and the sun. You want to sit outside if you can for five, 10 minutes when the sun is at a slant as it's coming up. So very interesting question there uh, that I've long wondered about myself. So, uh, and it also, it can depend and you can change. As you get older, you tend to be more of a, like either mixed or a morning kind of person. Um, younger people, especially when they're getting into adolescence, tend to be um, much more night owl kind of people. So, uh, so it also depends on the time in your life. Okay, uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, just kind of following up on that, and because like everybody's kind of different, right? So I was wondering if there's like a correct uh, retrieving technique or, or something like that. Oh. So, 
retrieving. Interestingly, so we've just talked about focused and diffuse modes. Um, there, there are correct retrieving techniques, and the most important one is do not be looking at what you want to be retrieving from your own mind. When you are looking at it, you're focusing on it. When you're retrieving, you're using part of that diffuse mode. So closing your eyes, looking away from the book, uh, standing, going and sweeping, uh, making a cup of, of coffee or just something very routine, being, doing those kinds of things when you are retrieving, um, that is key. Another thing that's very important, well, in fact, we'll talk about this in just a minute, So, uh, but that's a good question. The big thing is you want to go into your own mind, which is what a diffuse mode partly is. So even when you're focusing on something that you're trying to retrieve from your own mind, it's still kind of, you're using a big part of the diffuse mode. Um, so, yes. I have a question. How long do you have to stay, for example? Oh, good question. So everyone, if you can just blink, blink for a moment. Okay, you open your eyes back up. You were momentarily in the diffuse mode. So interestingly, it can be very short. However, if you think about those neural processes of connection, those clearly can't take place in the short period of a blink of an eye. So you are in the diffuse mode, but usually about, I'll say this is rule of thumb, and we'll see a little bit more later on, uh, about five minutes of not focusing on things being in diffuse mode, that can help you. So if you're focusing, then you take a little break of five minutes or so. That's when you can, your brain can work away in the background and kind of consolidate these ideas. And we'll see a practical way of using that in just a moment. So good question. Um, and okay, so let's talk a little bit about multitasking. So multitasking, here's the problem, is everybody has a friend who's a really good multitasker. You know, and so then they go, oh, uh, or at least everybody has a friend who thinks they're a really good multitasker. <laughs> so, um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, multitasking. The, the reality is, uh, there's two flavors of multitasking. The first one is task switching, which means like you're reading something, then you look at your cell phone. So it's kind of like you're ripping up those neural roots and replanting them in something else. The other one is like you're reading, but you're also listening to music. And truly this dual tasking is something you can do at the same time. There is some evidence that um, when you might be studying, and listening to music. For some people, it doesn't seem to be much of an issue. It depends on how big your working memory capacity is, but it always does have at least a minor effect on your cognition. So, um, but on the other hand, if you're studying, sometimes people will like to study in a coffee house. You'll get those clanks of, you know, like something, you know, coffee cup hitting or something like that. What that does is you're studying, you're in the focus mode, it momentarily takes you in the diffuse mode as if kind of like an eye blink, but even more. So let's say you're studying physics and you're going along and you're really focused and you're just struggling with this concept. You're trying to understand it and then you get this clank it throws you out, takes you in diffuse mode for a moment. You come back and you go, oh, that's the way it is. Because when you come back, you land at a slightly different neural configuration. And sometimes that can make that breakthrough. So for example, let's say some students, let's say they're studying for medical school. Some students have superb memories. 
They can memorize all the anatomical terms simple. Yeah. And they, they like something that uh, one student might take weeks to prepare for a test, they can sit down in a couple hours, just scan it over, remember it all. That's easy. Then it comes to something like learning cardiac function. Cardiac function is really complex. It's not just memorizing a bunch of stuff. You've got to imagine in your mind, you know, all what is going on, where the blood flow is, you know, what's going on when during the, the different uh, parts of the process. And when you're studying something like cardiac function, it can actually be helpful to be in a coffee shop in particular, because you're not just memorizing stuff. You're trying to understand something really difficult. Clank, oh, wait. And it, it, as you're trying to put these concepts together, it draws you out, puts you back, and you can begin to see the big system patterns more easily. So I hope that's making sense. I'm trying to kind of give a little bit of a, uh, a feel for these kinds of things. Interestingly, so speaking of medical school, in, uh, in the US at least, there's a concept in medical school and uh, it's called a gunner. A gunner is the super smart student who always has the answer immediately for everything. So oftentimes, you know, you'll get these interns and residents together and the doctors will say, okay, who's got the answer for what the diagnosis is in this patient? The gunner is the one that goes, oh, I know. And they can rattle off everything. They've got it, they can, got it all memorized. But here's the thing, gunners do not make good diagnosticians. You're like, wait. But they can hear all the stuff, remember it, put it all together, and they're, you know, they're very fast. They should be the best at being able to diagnose all these illnesses. Here's what they do. They remember everything. They hear the words. They see the pattern. They make a connection, and that's it. Click. They've made the connection. They've made their diagnosis. They can't change their mind so easily. So they can make a diagnosis, but it may well not be the best diagnosis if they'd asked a few more questions and gotten a little more insight, they could have made a better diagnosis. So sometimes slower learners can actually be the smarter learners. So, uh, so as you might guess, there's a kind of a, a loss of efficiency when you are doing multitasking. There's about a 30%. If you're reading a book and then you keep looking at your cell phone, you're going to be less efficient, except for the 2% of people who are super taskers. That 2% of people ruin it for all of us. <laughs> uh, they, they actually have dopamine, differing dopamine that uh, uh, neural characteristics that make it so they can look at this, look here, look back, and change their, their thinking very quickly about these, about things. These individuals make super good um, emergency room physicians because, you know, when an emergency is happening, they got to be here, look at this, make sure this is going on. They can change how they're thinking about that things. They make good race car drivers, good uh, master chefs. I do not want a super tasker though. If I'm coming in with a really difficult to diagnose um, illness, I want somebody who's not bored by just delving very, very deeply into things. So it's okay if you are not this uh, multitasker who is very good at switching their thoughts at things. But uh, most students, as it turns out, um, are not very good at multitasking. In fact, the ones who can multitask best, these super taskers, they are often the least likely to multitask. So they, they can do it, but they just don't do it very well. Those who can't multitask very well 
are the ones who are most likely to multitask. So uh, they're also the ones who are most likely to fool themselves into thinking that multitasking works well for them. So, uh, so just be very uh, careful. There's something called illusions of competence as a learner. And this often involves just that idea of you, know, you think you've got it in long-term memory and, um, and you can do all sorts of different things, but you may well not have it in long-term memory. I do have to say, oftentimes when you're trying to learn something well, it's a good idea to push yourself hard. And I'll give you the counter example of this. So that actually represents me as a little girl. I found out, so my parents wanted me to learn how to play the piano. And I found out though, you know, I was a small kid. I found out if I just played anything on the piano, they thought I was practicing. <laughs> so I learned songs so well, a song, that I could play it over and over again, and I could put my comic books on in front of my music, and I could just read my comic book. And uh, of course, the long and the short of it was I never learned how to play the piano well. So, so it is important to push yourself when you're learning, but don't just be comfortable with wherever you're at. This, sometimes they'll say, oh, you should be in a flow state. Flow states are great. That's where you feel you can really do it and you're flying along, but they're for when you already are a master of the material. And, uh, but learning itself, you wanna always be pushing yourself. What's the hardest thing? So, so how to, to ensure that you're actually doing this, it, it can be valuable to avoid the biggest challenge in learning, which is procrastination. So procrastination, happens because when we even just think about something we don't like or don't want to do, it activates a part of the brain, the insular cortex that experiences pain. And we often just, you know, don't feel so good as a result. So what we can do is we can think about something we don't like or don't want to do, like whatever topic you don't want to be learning, um, or your taxes or whatever you don't want to be doing, you feel uncomfortable. So you change your thinking to something more pleasant and the result, you feel happier almost instantly. Do, do it once or twice, no big deal. Do it very often and you can actually think you can't do something because, I mean, we've all experienced known students um, who, just can't succeed in whatever that subject is. And it's not because they didn't have the capability to do it. It's just because they put it off until the last minute and few people can learn in that stressful kind of situation. So the best, uh, I'm an engineer now, it's just jump to the chase. What is the most effective way to, to help you get past procrastination? It's the Pomodoro technique. This was invented by an Italian, Francesco Cirillo, in the 1980s. It's super simple, unless you hear about it from academics. I have actually gone to a Pomodoro session, you know, about the Pomodoro, and it was a simple 25-step process. I was like, nobody's gonna do the Pomodoro after us academics got, got loose on, the, on this idea, but it is. Truly simple. All you do is you turn off all distractions, set, so no pop-ups on your computer, nothing like uh, on your cell phone or whatever. Good luck if you have a two-year-old at home. Uh, and then you just set a timer for 25 minutes. Work, focus on it as intently as you can for those 25 minutes. So that means like if you're working on it and you suddenly think, oh, I wanna go see what's on television this evening. You just keep your focus right back because the reality is anybody can do 25 minutes of focus. 
And when you're done, give yourself a nice relaxing little break for five minutes or so. So what is this doing? It's a clever way of focus plus, uh, plus a little bit of a five minute diffuse mode break. So you're focusing and then you're giving yourself. What is your tendency going to be to do during that five minute break? You will um, want to pick up your phone, right? But if you pick up your phone, you're focusing again. Even if you tell yourself, I'm just going to, uh, you know, I'm just going to take a peek. Oh, wait, no, he answered. Oh, I better reply. And you're going right back into focus mode and you're writing over what you've just learned. So five minutes of nothing. Yeah, I mean, you can sweep the floor, maybe listen to a little music uh, or just something relaxing. That can really be uh, super helpful for you. So I would say hide your cell phone, right? Or do so, well, maybe not do this kind of thing, but you know, you want to try to avoid having your cell phone around it, except if you, there are techniques. Some people will actually use these kind of containers to uh, lock up their cell phones. And that can work. There's also all sorts of websites that you can use to keep an eye on how much time you're spending on surfing the web or whatever. There's, there are some really good apps out there. Uh, you see Forest on the right, uh, which is if you, it's an app that encourages you to do Pomodoros. You plant a tree. If you complete a Pomodoro, you uh, kill a tree metaphorically at least, if you don't. So um, I also sometimes just advise people, if you have something like two and a half hours, do four Pomodoros and a half an hour break after that. So um, I think we're, we're probably at a, we've got eight minutes left. So I want to uh, ask if you have some questions because I probably have a slide that can show you some answers related to whatever the question is. Uh, so uh, do you, does anyone have any questions at this time? I have a question about the Pomodoro. So you think, because sometimes students say, oh, I can't focus for 25 minutes. Do you think it's still good for them to try 15? Yes. Yep. Take a five break. yep. Yep. What the Pomodoro can do is it helps enhance your ability to focus longer. So if you start with shorter periods, the challenge has been today, there is some evidence that with this, uh, I mean, the way that social media is built is it's built to be addictive and to cause you to jump, you know, and, and dip and desire quick changes that attract your attention. So you, you watch all the social media and you're getting trained to continue to desire these little dopamine hits of uh, pleasure when you are quickly switching to something new. But you can retrain your brain to get back into being able to focus uh, for longer periods of time that's the great thing about the human brain is you're pretty flexible. So if you really have trouble with longer periods, starting with shorter Pomodoros is perfectly fine. And there's nothing magical about that 25 minutes of a typical Pomodoro. I mean, no one did some extensive studies from neuroscience. What they did do is there's one study that does show that after 20 minutes of work on something, do you know when you start something, there's this like pain in the brain that you're overcoming? After about 20 minutes, that pain goes away. So that's why a Pomodoro can be very helpful for you as far as uh, you get started. And then have you ever noticed you, just getting started is three quarters of the battle and you get going and then you start enjoying it. One thing I do find is if I have something really, really new, 
that when I first start trying to do pomodoros on it, it's agony for the first few days. But I, I just tell myself, oh, 25 minutes today and then the next day. And then I find by after the third, fourth, fifth day, I'm kind of like, oh, really? I can only do 25 minutes, you know? And, and I keep working on longer and I'm actually enjoying it more. So your own mind, it's, it's just that 25 minutes uh, starting to get into the new subject um, and getting started in the subject, which is really helpful. Um, one thing I've also found is, um, does anyone uh, have challenges with a messy house? Yeah. Messy house. <laughs> so if you just set yourself like doing a Pomodoro each day on, you're just cleaning something. You just, you know, and you just clean that, whatever that is. And that's all you have to do. And I generally, I'll pick one thing. So it might be, I might working on a bureau or, or one room or something. But I remember when I started, first started doing this, my husband, after a while, was kind of like, are you wanting a temperature? How, you know, are you doing okay? Because it's starting to look clean around here, which is unlike you. So no, he wasn't like that, but he was, it was uh, quite noticeable. So Pomodoro's, are great for uh, not only for learning, but for productivity of all sorts, even at the home. So um, other questions? The other questions? Yes. What would be your advice to incentivize this, uh, we call the method of learning in a non-school environment? I want to teach my managers to keep learning, but if there's no advice, Incentives to keep learning is quite difficult to make them recall things because there's no more use to it. Oh, so incentives are always important. So you might build into their their um, okay. So let's let me see if I can show you this one. Okay, so you can create. Okay, what I want you to do. So um, look. Okay. Hang on just a sec. Let's, okay, whoops, no. Okay, so see where that is pointing up in the upper left-hand side? This is a way of creating groups. You can create groups within your business and ask your individuals to go in and create retrieval practice flashcards on whatever you want and share them with the group, and you can take a look at what they're creating. So you could use this as a way of, you know, monitoring whether they're doing retrieval practice. This is a, I love this, it's called I Do Recall. And let me show you kind of how it, so you can make these flashcards and they're really cool. So here's a flashcard I'm just creating a flashcard. This is on a subject. I'm learning more about default mode network. So I'm creating flashcards. I can, I can test myself. I can download ebook notes, cut and paste from ebooks and uh, from my notes to them, easily create a flashcard from my ebook notes that I've, you know, my key notes. And uh, so there's one, it's called the pedagogy delusion, which is like you're fooling yourself that you're actually teaching. And, um, uh, but also you can do things like upload PDFs and, and easily create a flashcard. And what's great is you can, when you're checking whether you know the answer to it, and you can even go and like, this is my favorite neuroscientist, you can go and look at the, um, the YouTube scripts and create notes from those YouTube transcripts. So, I mean, it's like any way you want to do it. Soon they will be uh, rolling out a new device or a new way of doing things that uses chat GPT to see what is um, like if I uploaded a PDF 
What are the key insights I should be getting from this PDF? And it creates the cards for me. So, I mean, um, okay, there is so much in learning from ChatGPT that is going to help us as learners and as educators. I just, I, have you been, have you all been using ChatGPT? I love it. So, for example, and so people were like, oh, it's not creative. It's not people. Well, actually, they did studies on students uh, or, or, and they found out what normal everyday people create, you know, when they're being creative, uh, like when you're having students get together and create uh, ideas, that ChatGPT is far more creative and innovative in the ideas it has. So just like Gary Kasparov, uh, he was the first chess master to be beaten by you know, artificial intelligence. But what he says is the best chess players, they have it in their mind, but they also get insight and advice from AI. And that's what we will be doing in the future is coming up with you know, these kinds of great... Uh, I did, so I was asked, to give a talk on pathological altruism for teachers for a conference in November, or no, October. And so, so I uploaded a paper I'd written uh, on pathological altruism. I asked Claude2, which is a, you know, chat GPT website where you can upload more, uh, more extensive materials. I asked it to come up with an abstract for a talk I would give for teachers on this Proceedings of the National Academy of Science paper that I wrote, that abstract was so good it gave me ideas for how I could better do the talk. <laughs> so it was really uh, quite marvelous. Um, so if you happen to be you know, teaching, uh, there's all sorts of great retrieval practice apps. So you can encourage your, you know, people at your work to use these. But if you happen to also be teaching live and in class, Pear Deck and Nearpod allow you to push out retrieval practice questions and also get feedback back um, that you can show anonymously to the class or to your work, for example, um, about how well they're actually retrieving some of these ideas. Good question. Any other questions? Have I? Have you Given you enough today, I'm so much more. Uh, so, yes. It is more like a comment related to exercise. Uh, I also think you have the Hureman slide. He also talks about uh, the breath and how breath, breathing, and breathing exercises can improve your focus and your uh, attention span. That is so. Um, that's exactly right. And so let's look at a little bit of breathing. So I can show you, um, come back here. Okay. So I'm gonna, this is kind of, um, come back here. Okay. So when you're nervous, you often breathe from the top of your, so Huberman is great because he gives you insight into what's going on, um, you, you know, sort of how to conduct your life, integrating breathing um, into it in a way that can enhance your, uh, a lot of, of different things going on in your life. But there's a wonderful book by James Nestor, I believe it's called, and it's called Breath. But this book is, um, it talks about, for example, the American Indians how it was common throughout the Americas for parents, like mothers would block the nose, or uh, they block the, the mouth of the child to ensure that the child always breathed through their nose because it can be more helpful. But in any case, when you're really nervous, you tend to breathe only from the top of your chest instead of like, so you'll be like <laughs> kind of panting up here instead of breathing. <sighs> and it, so try, try putting your hand on your stomach 
And now what I want you to do is I want you to breathe in such a way that what, what will happen, it's something like, like you want to draw that air all the way down so that it is actually like pushing in the bottom of your lungs against your belly. And you can almost feel your belly kind of expanding out a little bit. So the idea is to draw your air all the way down so that you're actually, you're, it, it pushes against your stomach and your stomach expands. When you are doing this belly breathing, you're drawing air much more deeply and it can help you so you're not so nervous. Because when you, it, let's say you have to get up and give the speech of your lifetime and you're in front of thousands and you're like, <gasps> you start breathing really uh, from the top of your, your uh, chest and you're not drawing oxygen in and you think you're panicking because it's a stressful situation, but you're actually panicking in large part because you're not drawing in enough oxygen. You're not getting enough air. So pulling that deeply into your chest, you know, with your breathing can be very, very helpful. And so this little guy right here, he's trying to show, don't breathe from the top of your chest, kind of breathe deeper and uh, th that will help you be more relaxed with your whatever you're trying to do. So, good question. Okay, well, I think we're about uh, wrapped up here. Feel free to come up and ask me any more questions if you might like. And uh, all I can say is I, uh, I love UFM. I love everything that it stands for. And it's an honor for me to be able to share here with you. Thank you.